to be in your presence tonight. God, what a mighty, mighty work you have done for us. God, as we enter into this time where we gather around your word, I pray that you help us to set aside any distractions that we walked in with. I pray that you speak a truth to our hearts that only you can do. We love you and we praise you and we thank you for this time of worship. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my name is Russell Dixon, and I have the privilege of being our sports pastor here at Second Baptist. I oversee all of our adult sports ministry, which essentially that just means that I break up fights and in real games that go on. That's really all that means. Uh, and I get the privilege of assisting with our children's sports ministry as well. And because a lot of our adult sports leagues are comprised of young singles, I also help with our singles ministry as well, in addition to some social media stuff. Uh, my fiance, Liz Mitchell, is our first through fifth children's Bible study director. Uh, she's definitely my better half, and I'm blessed to be on measure to have her. My dad has been on our staff for 34, 35 years now. Uh, a long time, he's ancient, so. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I can tell you, it has been the greatest joy of our family's lives to have the opportunity to be tethered to this community here at Second. And so it truly is a blessing and an honor to have you here uh, to worship with us tonight. I wanna speak uh, tonight from uh, the book of Matthew. If you brought your Bibles, do me a favor and turn to the book of Matthew in chapter 11. If you didn't bring your Bibles, that's great because thanks to technology, we're going to have it on the screens for you. Uh, don't know where all of you are on your faith spectrum. I never want to assume that everyone already has a relationship with Christ. And so if you're doubting or searching or seeking, I want to say welcome. Uh, this is a good place for you to just figure out questions, to ask, to search, to seek. And so we're really glad that you're here. I want to give you a little bit of context about the book of Matthew and then about chapter 11 in particular. So Matthew was written by a guy uh, by the name of, drumroll please, Matthew. So really shocking on that. He was also known as Levi. Now he was a tax collector and these tax collectors were, they were not very well liked. Uh, I know that sounds surprising or hard to believe, but they were not very well thought of. And so when Jesus encounters him, when he encounters Matthew, and he calls him to follow after him, there seems to be little or no hesitation on Matthew's part. He just seems to be like, okay, hey, come follow me. And Matthew's like, all right, let's go. And so uh, coming up to our text, Matthew writes from the perspective, he's writing to a primarily a Jewish audience. So the uh, overriding theme that he's going to have is this idea of fulfillment, that Jesus is in fact the fulfillment of prophecy. A lot of the Jewish culture had a hard time believing that Jesus was the Messiah and that he, in fact, was who he says he was. And so when Matthew writes, when you read it, uh, it's going to be from this idea that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy and is a king. Now, chapter 11 in particular, it opens up with John the Baptist, who was the preparer of the way for Jesus. And he had, in fact, been sent to prison during this time. And so even John the Baptist, who was the preparer of the way, had his own questions about Jesus. And so he sends some of his own followers to ask Jesus questions. Hey, who are you? What's going on? What do I do with my hands? I don't know. You know, they're just asking a lot of questions uh, of Jesus. And so Jesus answers those questions, obviously. And so as we approach this portion of text, we're going to read verses 20 through 30. And I've just got three practical truths that I wanted to share with you tonight. And I hope that it speaks to you uh, as we unpack it. So we're going to read verses 20 through 30 here. They should be on the screen uh, as we dive in. So Matthew 11 Verse 20 and following says, Then Jesus began to denounce the towns where he had done so many of his miracles, because they hadn't repented of their sins and turned to God. What sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. Now just to explain, this is what people did in this culture. They didn't just wear burlap around as a, as a style. This wasn't like a new fad or a hipster trend. They did this out of a great sign of remorse in this day. Verse 22, I tell you, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you. And you people of Capernaum, will you be honored in heaven? No, you will go down to the place of the dead. For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Sodom, it would still be here today. I tell you, even Sodom will be better off on Judgment Day than you. Verse 25, at that time Jesus prayed this prayer. Thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. 
My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father, and no one truly knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Now these next three verses are really where I want to camp out today. It says this, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. That sounds like a pretty sweet deal. Sign me up for that team. I want to speak to you for the next few moments from the subject, the yokes on you. The yokes on you. And I'll explain more of what I mean here in just a second. But let's pray one more time before we dive into this. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you uh, that we have the opportunity to gather around it. Father, we pray that you just help us to set aside any distractions that we walked in with. God, you know that I don't have a thing to say, but we know that you have much to say to us tonight. Speak to us in this place. We ask for the power of your Holy Spirit. We don't need more facts. We don't need more data. We need your presence in this place tonight. We love you and we thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Any practical jokers here tonight? There's a group back here that needs to all be raising their hand. Um, I'm a huge fan of practical jokes, and I have been the victim of some practical jokes in my day. One such being, so I, before I came on staff at second, I had the privilege of playing college baseball at Auburn and then got drafted by the Astros. I was not very good, hence why I'm on our staff today. So um, I'm still dealing with it. Don't worry about it. I, I cry every night. It's not a good deal. So, um, but my first minor league season, I struggled. I had a good first half, but the second half I struggled a lot. And one of the particular areas that I struggled in was I struck out a lot. For those ladies that don't know baseball, that's not good. So, um, but so I struck out a lot, and so I went into my second full season. As every professional baseball player hopes, you hope to move up. You hope to move up the ladder. Well, I find out after having a good spring training that I was getting sent back to the same place that I went the year before. Now, this league that I played in had a ten, it was Charleston, West Virginia, and the team there was the West Virginia Power. Now, there was a fan in this town that is like legendary in minor league baseball, and his name was the Toast Man. And the reason why they called him the Toast Man was because every time an opposing player would come in and would strike out, he would drum up the entire stadium to say, you are toast, you are toast, you are toast. Pretty embarrassing if you're an opposing player. Well, of course, as fate would have it, I opened this second full season after having hoped to move up, and I'm starting back where I was the year before, in where else other than Charleston, West Virginia. And so I go in for my first at bat, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to have a good year. I'm going to show the Astros what's up. I'm going to hit a lot of home runs and prove them wrong. I'm going to move up. And I come up for my very first at bat, haven't swung a bat, mind you, haven't taken a swing. And all of a sudden, I hear this faint roaring stance. I'm trying to figure out, I'm like, dude, I haven't even swung a bat. What's going on here? And I can't make out what they're saying. Sure enough, after a few minutes, I'm digging in, and I hear the entire stadium of 10,000 people chanting, King of Toast, King of Toast, King of Toast. You see, he had done his homework and figured out that I had struggled the year before and had thus dubbed me the nickname, the King of Toast. But when it comes to the idea of practical jokes, I am convinced that the devil is the ultimate practical joker. And here's the joke that he wants to play on each and every one of us. That you, each and every one of you, have to carry your burdens by yourself. That we're alone in this life, that there's nothing we can do, that we have to shoulder the burdens of life alone. And what we're going to see here today by the end of the story is that the devil always pays in counterfeit money. And so we're going to know by the end of today that that just is not true. So let's look at verses 20 through 24 again really quickly. It says, Then Jesus began to denounce the towns where he had done so many of his miracles, because they hadn't repented of their sins and turned to God. What sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida, for if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of their sins long ago, clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. I tell you, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day than you. And you people of Capernaum, will you be honored in heaven? No, you will go down to the place of the dead. For if the miracles I did in you had been done in wicked Sodom, it would have been here today. 
I tell you, even Sodom will be better off on Judgment Day than you. So immediately, what jumps out about that portion of the text is that the only conduit for our condemnation is a channel apart from Christ. I'll say that again. The only conduit for our condemnation is a channel apart from Christ. These people in these towns had seen Jesus do a bunch of miracles. They had seen him teach. They had seen him preach. As a matter of fact, this area of Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum was known as the Evangelical Triangle. It was where Jesus did most of his public ministry. So Jesus had begun to teach and preach and do miracles, and they had seen Jesus do these works, yet they still didn't believe that he was who he said he was. And, and I find that for us today as Christians, that we're often in the same boat, right? We see God do all these great works in our life, and we still doubt him when he brings us to trials in our life. We still doubt the plans that he has for us. And so what I want us to be encouraged about, wherever you are on the faith spectrum, is that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So our only safe place is in Christ, right? No matter where you are. We know that Jesus is a safe place, and for those that haven't trusted in Jesus, we want to give you that opportunity at some point tonight. But for those of us that are in Christ, the temptation for us is to walk away from him. Because we have sins and burdens in our life, we want to go our own way and not trust that God's way is better than ours. I read a story recently about shark divers, which is terrifying, by the way. Um, I don't know why on earth you would ever want a shark dive, but these shark divers, when they go down in the water, those cages that they make are virtually indestructible. So as long as the divers are inside that cage, they're safe. I mean, no matter what happens, as long as they stay inside that cage, they're safe. I think I've got a picture of it here somewhere. That's terrifying. So they're inside that cage, they're safe, all right? Follow me here. So, but for some reason, when a lot of these shark divers go down there, and I don't know, again, why would you do this? I mean, I was terrified to swim in the deep end of the pool because I was convinced Jaws was lurking and waiting <laughs> below that drain. And I was like, ah, don't get me. So, but when they get down there, these shark divers, their tendency, because they're so mesmerized by these fish, is they want to get outside that cage. I read this quote from a shark diver that said, It's really hard to explain and describe the feelings when you see this huge but gracious fish. You're overwhelmed with the emotions and totally forget about its frightening and thrilling danger. So even though they know that the only safe place that they have is inside that cage, they still want to get outside of it. That applies to us today, too. We know that the only safe place is within Jesus. Yet how many times are we guilty of wanting to walk away from him? I think the application for us as Christians today, or wherever we are, if we're not in Christ, is to stay in the cage. Stay connected to Christ. And he promises that you'll always be safe. Let's keep moving to verse 25 and following. It says this, At that time Jesus prayed this prayer, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever, and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. So what jumps out about that is that God doesn't reveal himself to the, the self-righteous. He revels in those who have run to him in humility. I'll say that one more time. God doesn't reveal himself to the self-righteous. He revels in those who have run to him in humility. So Jesus starts praying this prayer, and it's, it's a little bit of a rhetorical prayer. I mean, it would be like if I was praying in front of my friend who was wearing a red shirt, and I was like, Dear God, thank you for my friend who's wearing a red shirt. And it's pretty obvious what he's doing here. He's speaking a word of condemnation to those who think they're self-righteous, to those who start to boast in their own works. He's really kind of speaking out against the Pharisees, the scribes, those who started to think, well, I've done some good things, and so I really think I've kind of got it going in this life. And how often are we guilty of doing the same thing? We start serving a little bit, we start going to Angels of Light, maybe we're teaching in a Bible study, maybe we're doing all of these things, and we start to kind of feel puffed up inside, like, wow, I've really got it going on. And the truth of the matter is that none of us, no matter who we are, are worthy of the gift that God gives us in His Son, Jesus Christ. I wrote a book a while back about Mount Everest. Um, again, another thing that 
I, I seem to be intrigued by these things that I would never do, ever. Like, I'm terrified of heights, I'm terrified of sharks, but I'm just fascinated by these people to do it because I'm like, ah, I'm going to live vicariously through you. So these guys that climb Mount Everest, it's funny because the, thousands of people flock from all over the world to climb this mountain. And usually the ones that have more success are the less experienced climbers. And I, when I read that, I found that shocking. The reason for this is because the more experienced climbers, they come to the mountain and they think, dude, I've climbed all of these mountains, I'm good. And so they start just steamrolling up this mountain and they forget that they have to allow their bodies the opportunity to acclimatize as they go up the mountain. There are several different camps as they go up, and so they have these stops set up as like an intentional pacing for people to be able to allow their bodies to adjust. And so these guys that are more experienced climbers, they run up the mountain basically, and what happens is they get towards the top, and they end up finding that they come down with all of these sicknesses, these high altitude sicknesses, uh, all sorts of fancy diseases that I can't pronounce or, or even pretend to understand. But what happens is these less experienced climbers, the ones who have humility, are the ones that a lot of times end up reaching the top. I find that so true of us as people, as human beings, as citizens of this life. Let us not be a people that start boasting in our own self-righteousness, that start boasting in all of the things that we feel like we've done. Let us only boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. Let us only boast in the wonderful things that he's done for us and the wonderful plans that he has for our life. Let's look at verse 28 through 30. It says this. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. It's a pretty good deal. It's a pretty good deal. So what jumps out about that is that the joke is on the devil when, when the yoke of Jesus is on you. I'll say that again. The joke is on the devil when the yoke of Jesus is on you. I want you to notice here that it says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. This would have flabbergasted the crowd that Jesus was speaking to. The reason for this is because in this day, the Jews thought that they were the only ones who had the access to God. They thought that because they were God's chosen people, they were the only ones who had the ability to have a relationship with Him. So when Jesus said, come to me, all, literally, anyone and everyone, the crowd probably would have literally sucked air, like, oh my goodness. But what Jesus is offering is this incredible invitation to anybody, anywhere, anytime, any place, that is looking for rest from their burdens. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I played sports growing up. And one of the things that we did was we would have to, if you wanted to train for speed, you had to use one of these running sleds. And so how you would do this is you would take these little gizmos here, 